let me start by saying that it's inevitable that you will make some mistakes and get yourself the wrong pieces of gear during your photography career, but the good news is, it's not too bad. They will serve you to understand more about your style, the type of images you want to create, and the shooting experience you like the most, and over time, you will become a more confident photographer with the right set of tools you really need. Making mistakes when acquiring gear can be detrimental to your finances. You have to place some of your money into a new piece of lens, camera, or whatever, and if it turns out that you don't use that piece of gear all that much, it will be money poorly invested. That said, I think it is definitely not the end of the world because when it comes to photography and video equipment, the second-hand market is very active, so you will be able to sell and get a good part of the money back. Think of that difference between the purchase price and the resale price not as a pure loss, but as a lesson to, like I said before, understand more about yourself, your needs, and what kind of work you really want to make. So today I will give you a few examples of mistakes I did in my journey so far, elaborate about why they were not the right gear for me, all for different reasons, and hopefully it will guide you a little bit in your upcoming photography gear investment. I am not against gear mistakes, as you could understand, but still I'm happy if I can spare you a few coins and some time in the process by sharing my experience, so let's get started. The 70 to 200. That one was totally overhyped in the last few years. YouTube videos showing street photography, car photography, and many more using that lens were popping up, and I totally felt into the trap. I had quite a bit less expense than now, so it really got me with the long focal length look and the bokeh you can achieve with such a lens, especially if you get yourself the Holy Grail 70 to 200 f2.8. Ironically, I got myself the Tamron one, which is a 70 to 180, so not quite 200 on the long end, but it serves the same purpose. The only reason that motivated my choice to get this lens is purely that I wanted to replicate the kind of images I saw online. For street photography I could kind of justify it because even though I was still in the early stages of my street photography practice, that was something I was doing regularly and saw myself doing for a very long time, or basically forever, but for the car photography side of things, not really. First of all, I appreciate a nice looking car, but I really don't have further interest into them and into the whole car industry. Secondly, I had no real intentions to force myself into liking cars to the point of reaching out to people to shoot their nice sports car or luxury cars. It was only me wanting to shoot the random beautiful car would see in the streets and feel the experience of shooting it with a long focal length, wide open at f2.8 for maximum Okay. But here I'm adding a little bit of nuance. I eventually used this lens for a small recurring photography job. A friend of mine introduced me to a local cycling team that I ended up shooting when riding their bicycle at full speed on the road. The lens did a fantastic job. It was totally needed and appropriate for the kind of photo they wanted. So with this example, we can see that there was a better way to deal with this lens. I bought it because I wanted to copy other cool stuff I saw online. And I also convinced myself that it will be useful when I have a car photography or a sports photography job. What I should have done is waiting for that job with the cycling team to enter, evaluate what kind of gear is needed, and only then getting a 70 to 200 on loan or from a friend. After that, if this type of job became recurring and I enjoy doing them, buying my own 70 to 200 would have made total sense. The reality is that I'm doing something very different now. I have no job that needs me to use a 70 to 200, and this lens has been sitting on the shelf without use for more than a year. Fantastic lens for the price, by the way. They released the version 2 that I believe is even better, so I can only recommend it if you really need a fast, long focal zoom lens, but I will be selling my own. So the message with that first mistake is that it shouldn't be, I need this gear if I get this job, it should be, I got this job, so I need this gear. When I started on YouTube, I was watching at what other people were doing to take inspiration and also understand what kind of equipment is required to create such videos. The mistake I made was telling myself that I want to be a YouTuber, so I need the super wide angle lens to take some vlog footage. And given that also a lot of other YouTubers include drone shots as B-roll to fill their videos, I also got myself a drone. But the thing is that there is a million way to create videos that will end up on YouTube. You could be doing only talking headshot with some GoPro footage, voiceover and only photo Photos, or indeed doing a lot of vlogging, talking to the camera while doing your things in the streets or in the nature. There is just no right or wrong way to make a YouTube video. But the mistake I made is that I let the title, being a YouTuber, and what I thought it means dictate my purchase decision. What you want to do instead is thinking first about what kind of video you will make and reverse engineer to understand what kind of equipment you will need and finally make your purchase decision. Now I understand that at the start of doing YouTube or any other thing, you don't really know yet what direction you will take 
take and what type of work you will be making in the end. But for example, a great way to see if it's worth it getting a video camera for your B-roll or a wide lens for your vlogging footage is using your smartphone. It is not the best quality, we agree on that, but recent phones are so versatile that you can do a lot of things in real life conditions to better understand what you really want to create and therefore what gear you need. On my channel I do a lot of talking headshots, voiceover or even silent videos so definitely I don't need any vlogging equipment. Drone footage also went a bit out of fashion and would anyway not add a lot to my creation so I absolutely don't need neither of the drone or the super wide angle lens. Don't let the title define what you need. Your work and what you want to create has to dictate your decisions. So if you want to know, it was the Talmon 17-28 f2.8 and the DJI Mini 2. I eventually took a few cool pictures at the music shows and also at other occasions with the super wide angle lens but really did not use it at all apart from that. A very good lens once again so the mistake is not about buying bad gear but really about buying gear that doesn't fit your workflow. I got rid of it at a decent price but about the drone you should be a bit more careful because we are still in the cycle for this technology where the progress is so fast that from one year to another a drone will lose a lot in value. I still have my DJI Mini 2 and this mistake was a bit more serious financially speaking because now I can only sell it at a very reduced price. Sometimes the best is not the best solution for you. The Sigma 35mm f1.4 is the lens I am constantly blown away by the images it takes. It is also the lens I am using to record this talking headshot in my office, but apart from that, it stays a lot of the time on the shelf. When I know that I am doing a more quote-unquote serious photoshoot for my family, friends or clients, I don't mind using that lens because it has delivered incredible results time and time again, so I fully trust it. I like everything about it, the colors, the contrast, sharpness and overall feel of the images it captures but the considerable size and weight are really big obstacles that prevent me from using it more for street photography and travel. If you have followed the recent videos you should know that I use a lot a 35mm pancake lens from Samyang. It is only f2.8 but it is so light and small that it almost feels like nothing. Actually 2.8 on full frame can deliver a good amount of pocket so you are not losing too much. The overall image quality is less good than the Sigma that's not even a debate but still it is good enough to provide great results for my street and travel photography. What I understand by making this mistake is that for a more mobile type of photography practice, the size and the weight of your gear is a very important factor. Going for the absolute best available, even if you have all the financial means for it, is not always the best solution. When we look at what other photographers active on YouTube are using, we can clearly see a resurgence of these kind of smaller lenses. There is a little sacrifice to be made in terms of maximum aperture and overall quality, but the way it motivates you to take hundreds and hundreds of photos is clearly what can potentially lead you to take the best shots and it is not the enormous picture-perfect f1.2 prime lens. So I hope these few examples coming from my own experience can be helpful. Thanks a lot for watching until the end and see you next time. Bye.